All right, so thank you for coming. Um, as he said, my name is Manuel Gomez. I'm a creative technologist. I'm based in Berlin, working in the intersection with art and technology. And lately, I think around like the last three years, I'll be a lot more interested in, in the using light as an expressive medium. So that would be how would I, um, how would I make art and technology. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about like, um, how to generate expressive meaning with light. So first of all, I just want to explain you the foundations of light, because, this is, uh, because I'm going to talk about, a lot about that, and you need to understand where it is and where I'm coming from. So um, light is defined um, as electromagnetic radiation on the visible uh, that humans can see. So it's visible for us. From the red to the violet and all the colors of the rainbow is what we see. But of course, in physics, light also can mean like, um, like other wavelengths, other frequencies like um, X-rays, gamma rays, microwaves, or, um, or radio frequencies. I'm not going to talk about that. That's things for the physics, that's things for the optics. Um, but I'm going to talk more about like, the, um, what we can see and how can we express that, how can we, um, the aesthetics of lights. Um, and of course, um, since the beginning of humankind and of the Earth, the main source of light has been the sun. The sun is it's critical um, because it, it warms up the, with its light, it warms up the Earth. It, uh, it controls weather patterns and, of course, is the initiator of life-sustaining process called photosynthesis. So it's, it's life, basically. And also, on a, on a greater scale, the interaction of light and matter has shape the structure of the universe even. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about uh, also the colors of the sun. So as you may know, like uh, during, uh, during the day, like um, the colors of the sun changes. From the sunrise to the sunset, it could go from reddish to yellow, orange to like uh, daylight, like bluish, pretty white. And that's something we've, it seems natural for us. It, um, we have sensors for that that regulates our circadian rhythms, like how do we sleep, how do we wake up, how we're more active, how our liver works, and so on. So uh, we try to imitate that. So it's very, very natural that if you wanna if you wanna do like uh, lighting based on the sun, you would try to uh, you try to imitate those colors from like more amber to more like um, um, white to more like cool white even. Um, and um, it's what called like color temperatures. You get like from like a, like cooler to warmer anyway. That's uh, specifics. But uh, that's why in architectural light design, um, originally the main purpose was like uh, to light everything uniformly. That you could see everything that is pleasing to the eye, and of course then you could change the the quality of the light. You can change the color, so you could make it more like a, maybe more romantic or maybe more like active for the day day work. And that, that, that's, what, that's how usually um, architectural lighting design works, actually. And um, it, it's beautiful, it's pleasant, it's practical. Uh, but in nature also, um, light also interacts with all the materials, which is the most interesting part. It's not like uh, they just have a light source, it's just that it also hits different textures, different materials. This is a landscape of, um, of Switzerland, of the mountains. And um, as you can see, um, there, it's a very cloudy day, and there's a, there's a gap between the clouds where the sunlight just comes through very intensely. You can even see, you can even see like, a, like sunlight rays because it hits the haze of the moment. It also like hits certain pans of the landscape, and it makes this kind of like super saturated green, and it makes this kind of like darker green, even black parts. Um, it, it creates a lot of visual tension. Um, as you can see, and this is, this is just natural light. This is just uh, beautiful. And already the masters of, uh, of chiaroscuro, of, uh, which is Italian for like dark bright, already like knew that. And they were using these techniques to create, um, to create a sense of, of, of tension. And also like uh, also the artists in the Impressionism times, they also use the change of color just to create, uh, to express this kind of feelings. Like making like things more saturated or less saturated, they could create the same kind of um, emotion. So, so we came up with the idea that uh, that actually lighting it's essential on visual and in visual storytelling. Where like um, as a director, you could uh, you could focus the tension or the gaze of the of the audience to a certain place. You could create this kind of like visual tension. You could uh, 
you can predict things that are going to happen, and uh, you could even like uh, you could even like make um, be creative and make um, and be in part of the story. Of course, artists knew that, and artists have been using that for a long time. They've used they've been created with the colors, they've been created with the space, they've used light as a medium itself to create light sculptures, or even using light to create sculptures itself, but just changing colors, just changing the space, the architecture, and so on. Um, I'm, I'm going to get now a little bit more technical, because um, we're in the technical stage. Um, and I'm going to be based everything on stage lighting. I know that, uh, that most of you probably are not um, familiar with it, but it's, uh, they're fairly easy concepts, actually, how stage lighting works. And basically, if you wanna if you wanna light up um, a scene, you basically don't usually don't have just one light source. You would have many light sources, many light fixtures that are on top, like in this case. So then you could you could uniformly um, light everything, or you could even like make spotlights, or, or you, uh, you could do whatever you want. And that's why you need to have like multiple sources. You could even like change the direction. You could even change the light beam to make it like brighter. You can make it softer. You can make it harder. You could even change the color by using filters. In this case, you have like green filters, you have purple filters, and blue filters. So you can be very creative and stuff. That's how it usually, how it usually works. I hope you follow. Because um, that was how traditionally a light, technician light designer would work. Um, you would basically have all those lights available, and like with faders, with electronic faders, you could, uh, you could uh, change the amount of brightness for every single light. You could say, I want this light to be at 50%, this light to be off, and so on. And just manually, you would need to change that. And it would be like one fader per light. That was very intense until um, the digital uh, world came, which is, um, uh, which is called, in this case, DMX 512. This is like a digital, like, this is a standard, protocol standard on lighting um, design right now. So like everything is controlled. And how it happens now is like you only need a lighting desk, and then the, you need a data cable, and then their daisy chain. So basically now, um, you can control them by addresses, or what is called channels. So you can say, OK, I want, I want light number one to be at 50% brightness, but I want light number two to be at 100% brightness, and I want light number three to be at zero brightness. And everything would just be one cable right now. So it makes things a lot easier. And all of a sudden, you're also in the digital realm. Um, but of course, you need this huge piece of hardware, which is called like light con lighting console. If you're a lighting technician, of course you know that. You need to be trained to use that. Uh, uh, there's a lot of knobs. There's a lot of like um, actuators. There's a lot of, uh, of of rotary encoders. There's a screen and so on. Um, it's a it's a fairly complicated um, piece of hardware, and it's also very expensive that you need to use. So it's not very available for everyone. But then a new thing came. And then. Um, um, I, I haven't mentioned that, but like uh, DMX had its limitations. For instance, you could only you could only be able to um, to control 512 lights. But then a new technology came over DMX, which is called Rnet, which basically puts Rnet into UDP, into like networking communications. So like uh, all of a sudden, you had you could control a lot more, a lot a lot faster. But not only that, once you have Rnet and once you have like networking, you have you can use you can use computers right now. So you don't need a lighting desk. Any, any computer that can talk network can talk light. So this would be a typical setup that I will use for myself, which I would have a laptop. I will have a router, which is basically a way to distribute network communications. And then I would have what is called Rnet to DMX. So something that transforms Rnet, like network communications, to light control light controls. And you could have that in parallel. So you could control like huge venues. You could control everything from one laptop right now. So that's an interesting part of it. Um, and of course, then, if you have a laptop, you only, well, the only thing you need is software. You don't need a huge hardware. You don't need, like, a dedicated, uh, you need to dedicate yourself to like, understand how lighting works. You just need some software, and you could play around that you would do in Photoshop. Um, OK, so that's one thing. So now you've got. Now you've got lighting that it can be controlled digitally and over network, and you've got software that can control that from one laptop. But also, like uh, the lighting itself, the fixture has changed. We got it from incandescent bulbs, which were like bulky, they were big, they were like very power and efficient to what is to, to, towards now 
LEDs, which are like super small. And in this case, you even have like three LEDs in this very small package. It even has a chip. So it has R, G, and B, red, green, and blue. And that means right now, you can make it, uh, you can put it anywhere. They're so small, they're so tiny, you could put like a, uh, you could put thousands of these like everywhere. And, and also you could control them individually. So there would be like pixels. So you could say, pixel number one, I want you to be this color. And you have 60 million colors to choose for, just by combining red, green, and blue. So you could be a little more creative. Um, because of that, like the old school technologies of lighting, of using faders and, and, and lighting consoles, didn't work as easy anymore. So now um, you need to, we need to use a new kind of te technique that is called pixel mapping. Or basically now, you could, um, you could have any kind of like bitmap or image, video, or anything texture, and transform it directly into um, light commands. So how it works is like you have a 2D texture, you divide that into a grid, and then you assign one of those squares into one of those light fixtures, one to one. It's called mapping. You map one thing to another thing. So if you're familiar already with Photoshop and do, or you do video or do um, any kind of like art that it could be created into like 2D texture, you can do light. And um, I'm going to show you one example. Like um, in this case, in this case, it was just a grid, like a two by two, like a low dimensional um, display. But you could do any kind of arbitrary um, fixtures and arbitrary like um, dispositions. In this case, in this case, I've got like five LED strips just crossed into another five LED strips in this very like arbitrary uh, positioning. And I put a video on top of that. And this software basically what it's doing is trying to approach that video and those pixels into the light the light strips, the LED strips. And you can see, you're going to see now how it's going to work. Now I've got the video, you got the LED strips, and um, hopefully, boom, you got it. So that's the result. The result is some kind of like very abstract light patterns going on that is made out of video. And why is this so interesting? Because then, right now, you don't need to know how to use light. You, you just need to know how to use video. So uh, right now, if you're a video artist and you, can, and you know how to generate video, you could use that. It's what I do. I create um, generative graphics. I do parametric kind of like graphics on the video card, like this kind of shaders, where uh, in real time, I can change color, I can change speed, I can change any kind of behavior, actually. So things could can, uh, can get a lot more interesting. All of a sudden, like, um, all of a sudden, you don't need someone to operate. It could operate by itself. And I've done that. Um, this, I'm going to go now through some examples of work that, I, that I've been, that I've that I've done with other companies, and how I've been using like um, um, lighting in a generative way. In this case, um, we got this light sculpture that was within this smart building. This building was full with sensors. It had like window sensors, had like water sensors, electricity sensors, and I could read those in real time. So what happened is like we created this kind of like abstract way of representing these sensors in real time on this light sculpture, which also had the shape of the building. So sensors were telling the light what to do in real time. I wasn't doing anything. The software was doing it. Um, I also work in the, uh, for shows, for like DJ sets, like for the night. And in this case, you got the LED strips on the, um, on the edges. We also had like uh, light spots that were like, um, that were pr projected into this dome. And everything was audio reactive. That I mean, like while the DJ was playing, like it was creating the lights in real time. And the artists were able to, to choose their color palette, their behavior, and so on. So they were very happy. They were saying, oh, I want to have green, I want a yellow, and I want it to be fast. And I said, yeah, you got it. And they had it. And we had a blast. It was running all night long. We also did interactive stuff. Where, like, um, this was for a piece in, uh, for Milan, for like a shop, uh, for like a like shop window, and people were just passing by, and there was a camera. And the camera was just tracking the movement. It wasn't, it wasn't tracking any face whatsoever. And whenever they move, it would create this kind of like wave of color just moving with them. And people had a lot of fun, because like it was very easy to understand. It was very like design-wise, and, and the colors were beautiful. I've also used this kind of technique for like photography. In this case, this technique, it's called long exposure photography, where basically, you have the car, and the car exists, but that light sculpture that you see on top doesn't exist. The thing was created through long exposure. So you will, you will start a picture, 
the LEDs would move, would do a pattern, and then by the end of the picture, 10 seconds later, 20 seconds later, it would just shut down the shutter. And then at the end, the sum of all the light will create this beautiful picture, which is non-existent to the human eye. I've used it also for costume design, where we'll like integrate like uh, LEDs in costumes for like shows. F fashion tech using the same kind of um, the same kind of technique. What you we would create in this case a dress, a virtual dress, non-existent using long exposure photography. And also design, we created this kind of piece that it was. Um... Oh, sorry. Okay, it's moving now. A little kind of space where um, you could you could um, you could bring any kind of fabric that had any kind of color pattern on color palette. It would read the color palette and it would transform that into the wall. Now you see that it was gonna it's gonna turn reddish, bluish, and and whitish. And if you put any other kind of any kind of um, any kind of color palette, it would change that automatically. Let's see now. We got like four colors and it would change that into four colors. And also it does it in this very organic way. Very, um, very abstract. Um, and recently, I've been more interested in, in 3D pixel mapping, which is basically um, not working anymore in, the, um, in, two, in two dimensional textures, but I also work in three dimensional textures because at the end of the day, that light sculpture is going to be into a, a 3D surface. So I, try, I needed to find a way how to project 3D LEDs into a 2D layout that then would like, talk back into 3D. Uh, let's see if we could. Uh, this was for a car, for a Bentley car, for like 100 anniversary of them. And what was happening is like I would have like this kind of video that it would be mapped into 2D, that it would be then mapped into 3D, so that I could previsualize what is going to happen. All right. And uh, so th that was very quick, and uh, that was a little bit of uh, also like the background of all the works I've done. I have to say, um, sometimes it's. Um, it feels a little bit overwhelming. There's so many possibilities. You can be so creative, but they're also like they're hard deadlines. There's a lot of work behind them. There's a lot of sweat. There's a lot of like uh, people being stressed out and rushed and so on. And sometimes I forget um, just to chill out. And if I have the opportunity, I really love just to sometimes go outside, just take a look at the stars, and just um, realize how beautiful nature is, how immense it is, and how small I feel. And that feels really good. So thank you so much.